you guys sound really, really good today. Amen. You sound good every day. But you sound really good today. If you've got your Bibles, if you'll turn to Acts chapter 5, we are going to wrap up chapter 5. And uh, we're going to look at an uncommon source of common sense. Um, have you ever found yourself in the midst of a, a situation, a, a conflict, an argument? We talked about opposition and conflict last week. Have you ever found yourself in the middle of a conflict or opposition where, where you wanted to be the voice of reason? Have you ever been in a place like that? I'm, 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 I'm in a lot of meetings, and I, I've, I've learned early on that I'm rarely the one that is the voice of reason. And it's disheartening to me, but I try. And yet, there always seems to be that need for someone to put the kibosh, if you will, on all the bickering, all the complaining, all of the, well, I think and, and I believe and I, I want. And so in our text this morning, it's going to come from a very unlikely source. It's going to come from the opposition. If you'll turn, make sure you're in Acts chapter 5. Um, let me just, I'm going to back up. We're going to start here at verse 33, but I'm going to actually back up to verse 29 and just read it. So just listen to me for a second. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel, the forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. But, but, and there's that word again. But when they, they being the religious leaders, but when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they intended to kill them. But a Pharisee named, oh, and I can never get this right, and I've listened to it, Gamaliel, that's it, Gamaliel, that's what we're going to call him today. Gamaliel, um, a teacher of the law respected by all the people, stood up in the council and gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you propose to do with these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody and a group of about 400 men joined up with him, but he was killed, and all who were following him were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone, for if this plan or action is of men, it will be overthrown. But it, if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may be found fighting against God. Let's pray. God, I thank you for uh, this moment in time, this picture into the lives of, of the conflict between uh, Christianity and Judaism and the Romans and all the issues that were going on in the first century. Lord, that we can uh, see, Father, that even today, the words that are spoken and the truths that we see apply to us today as well. Father, I pray that we would be about every day of our life seeking you first seeking your will and your way above our own thoughts, our own um, ideals, our own rations and rationales. Father, that we in every way would, would intend on putting our life in focus with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'll get to the rest of this passage when, I, when, I, when we get finished here. But, but there's, there's a conflict Peter and John and the apostles, um, if you remember the last couple of weeks, they've been preaching and, and teaching, and, and it's changing the, the, the scope of, of Jerusalem. People are coming to know Christ as Lord and Savior. And what it's doing is it's changing those people's lives who've been saved, but it's also shaking and rattling and, and messing with the established religious system. And I mentioned last week about the Old Testament and the Old Covenant and that the, the book of Acts is kind of the, the fleshing out of the, the New Covenant because you've got the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that talk about Christ and talk about him being the fulfillment of God's promise of a Savior, of a Messiah, of one come from God who is going to save the people. 
And in Acts, we begin to, to, um, to see that step after step after step with the, with the coming of the Holy Spirit, with the empowering, with Peter being literally transformed from that, from that, that guy that, that always is the source of conflict instead of the source of, of sense. Peter is becoming the source of sense and the spokesman for God and the leader of the apostles. And so you've got this band of, of men and women who are focused no longer on the law, no longer on religion, but they're focused on Christ and they're focused on God. And it goes um, in conflict to what the establishment is saying. And so when Peter tells them, that basically we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we're speaking for God, this is the end of, that's what I just read, um, that basically we are being who God wants us to be, we're saying what God wants us to say, and we're living like God wants us to live. And the response to that was, they were angry and it cut them to the quick. It, it, imagine, if you will, lighting a fuse on dynamite, that's Peter talking, and then the explosion of the dynamite, that's, that's being cut to the quick. They went from, from, from being angry because they were still teaching and preaching to they were angry because they were challenging the very belief system of the religious establishment. And it, it, it led, them, led them to the place where it says, let me just read it, they intended to kill them. And so what's one of the commandments? Thou shalt not kill, right? Okay, so here's a principle and a lesson for all of us. If we know the Bible says we shouldn't do something and we intend on doing something, we're wrong. It doesn't matter what your belief system is. It doesn't matter if you're a Hebrew, if you're a Muslim, if you're a Christian, if you're a Catholic. It doesn't matter. If, if you say you're a person of God and you intend to do something that is contrary to what God says we're to do, then we are no longer right with God. Period. And that's, that's a principle that we can take with almost every question we have in our life. Should I do this? Should I think this? Should I behave this way? Should I act this way? If it's contrary to the word of God, the answer is no. It doesn't matter how we rationalize that it's, it's, it's for the greater good. There's no one that is more in tune with the greater good than the one who said this is good. And that's God. And so you have these two opposing forces and in the midst of this opposition where, where the religious leaders want to kill the apostles and kill Peter, especially Peter, where one guy, and his name is Gamaliel, that's what I'm going to pronounce it and I think that's right, um, he stood up and he said, um, excuse us, gentlemen. And they'd lead the apostles out. And, and he stands in front of his peers and he says, you need to think about this. You need to think about what you're doing. Because if you do this wrong, then we're in trouble. Because it won't be the people that are opposed to us. It won't be the Christians that are opposed to us. If we do this incorrectly, it's going to be God Almighty who we say we worship and follow, who we are in opposition to. And, and being the wise man that he was, and historically he was a wise man. He was, he was one of the leaders of the Pharisees. He was well respected. Uh, Josephus writes some on, 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 on Gamaliel. And so historically, we know besides biblical truth that there, there's also antiquities that were written that say this is exactly who this man was and exactly what he did at this moment in time. And so he is standing up and he is bucking the established system, being immersed in the established system, saying, well, hold it. Hang on just a second, guys. Does, does God really need us? To defend him against something that we think is in opposition to him. And then he uses two historical references. He says this. He said in verse 35. 
And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you propose to do with these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined up with him, but he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. Now, Thutis was, uh, he was nobody, and yet he wanted to be somebody, and he proclaimed himself to be a prophet. And, and in his, in his, great oratory um, ability, he drew a crowd of 400 people that followed him. And their goal was to, to not just overthrow Rome, but to make sure that they were, they were lining up with his idea of who God was. Well, there were two problems with Thutis. Number one, he opposed Rome, and they were captors of Rome. So he opposed the established government. And number two, he didn't like how the religion of the day was going about. And so he proclaimed himself to be the one who was going to be the purveyor of change. And in that mindset and in that, that historical uh, reality, he ended up dying for his cause. But nothing changed. And so this Gamaliel says, you know, just remember, not so long ago, Thutis came and he wanted, to, he wanted to change everything. He said he was from God. He said he was a prophet. But God took care of him. And it proved out that he was wrong, that he wasn't who he claimed to be. So maybe, maybe guys, maybe we should just take that same approach. Maybe we should just let God be God and see what God is going to do. Because if, honestly, if they would have done this wrong, there would have been an uprising. And it would not have been to the glory of God. And then he says this. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished and all those who followed him were scattered. Now, Judas is a little bit different he had the same idea, I don't like what I, I'm seeing, I want to overthrow um, the Romans. But I also, I, I really don't like the religious system. We've got the Pharisees, we've got the Essenes, and we've got, let me look so I make sure that I've got it right. The Sadducees, Pharisees, and Essenes. I want to start a different group. And we're going to call ourselves the Zealots. And here's my rationale, he said, for, for this, is that I don't think these religious groups are placing God at the place where God deserves to be placed. So I am going to overthrow the religious foundation and the religious system of the day, and I'm going to, to remove, kill anyone who stands in my way so that God is glorified. Do you see a problem with that? <laughs> Thou shalt not kill. And he died. Just like Judas. And these are just two of, of hundreds of men who proclaimed to come from God, who, who desired to lead the children of Israel to a better understanding and knowledge of who God was. And history proved out that they were all false prophets. And we all know the demise of a false prophet is death. And so Gamaliel, he, he, he literally says, think about the book that you worship. Think about the God that you worship. Is God not capable in this instance of doing the same thing that he's done in the past? That if the way, Christianity, and if the words of these apostles and, the, and these teachers and preachers are false, then isn't God big enough to do away with them as well? That's pretty, pretty common, sensical, right? And yet, I, I know from experience and from our experience that we like to fix things. We see you're wrong and we go, well, whatever it takes, we're going we're gonna to fix it, period. And a lot of times God just says, you know, God, sit down, be quiet. And be faithful doing what I've shown you to do in the past. Because if you remember from the past couple of weeks, the mission of, of the church was to tell the world that there was good news in Christ Jesus. 
their lot in life was not to overthrow Rome. Do you remember when, when, when Jesus was, was coming in for the triumphal en entry? The people thought he was going to overthrow Caesar. And they were worshiping him and, and, and laying down palm branches because they, they believed the time had finally come. God had brought a person who was going to relieve them of all their, their um, governing people from the Greeks to the Romans to the Babylonians and all, that, that God was finally going to establish them as a free people. And when they realized that Jesus was not a conquering king in that sense at this point, they turned their back on him. And so the mindset of those that say they follow Christ has got to be the same mindset that the Bible says a follower of Christ looks like. And so the mandate of the Christians and the church in Acts chapter 5 was tell the good news. Tell the whole story. Remember uh, uh, 519 it said, um, no it's not 519, I forget which, where it's at. But it says, tell them the whole story of this life. The salvation. Tell them the whole story of what it means to be born again, to be transformed, to be a person who, who, who no longer lives for self but lives for God. And so that's the basis for, for all the church was supposed to do was to go into the world and change the world by the power of the Holy Spirit by living a God-filled life. That's our mandate too. It hasn't changed. And so sometimes we get on our bully pulpits and we, we, we get our causes and those causes overshadow the reality of who we are in Christ. And causes aren't bad, don't mishear me. But when a cause supersedes the good news of who Christ is and our ability to share it, then that cause is no longer a worthy cause. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter how good it is. Because if we can't do what we do and look up to heaven and say, God, this is all for your glory and honor and wait for him to affirm that in us, then we're just doing it because it's a good thing to do. And so as the church, and I believe this is a problem with the 21st century church, is that we have so begun to focus on the peripheral instead of the person and the mission and the Great Commission. And in the idea of practicing what you preach has to be in the forefront of our lives. That we actually are the people that we expect other people to be. Have you ever looked at someone and said, you know, you're just not good enough? You're just not, you're not living up to my expectations of you? Have you ever done that? Go, raise your hand. I have. I used to manage a lot of different people and they were generally younger people and I was always, you know, you guys just, you're horrible, you're terrible. You guys are just lousy workers, you, you're late, you, you know, you, you don't know how to spell, you don't know how to add and, and it, you know, I found myself as the only employee. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was right, but I sure didn't go about it the right way. You know, it's, as the church, God has said, this is how you go about life. You go about life with me always in your view, whether it's the rear view, the side view, or the front view. And then you actually behave like you're my child. And so when, when this guy is saying this, he's telling this not to the apostles, not to the church. He's telling it to the religious establishment who says they follow God. He said, just hold on a minute. Verse 38, so in this present case, I say to you, stay away from these men. Stay away. Put a border around them. Put a fence around them. Put a hedge around them. But you guys need to stop messing with the church. And here's why. For if this plan or action of, is of men... It'll be overthrown. If this is just these guys acting out and wanting to be somebody, th then it's, we're going to destroy them. They'll be overthrown. We don't have to do anything but be faithful. And this is the Sad Sadducees and all that guy. We just have to be faithful to what we believe. 
So he was telling the religious establishment, we have to be faithful to what we say we believe. And let those guys be faithful to what they say they believe. And let God weed out those that are wrong. That's hard for us to do. That's really hard for us to do. And then he finishes his little spiel like this. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. If it's not of God, there's nothing you can do about it. You are powerless against God. And, or else, you may even be found fighting against God. You might even be in opposition to the one you say you worship. And this is from a person that doesn't profess salvation in Jesus Christ. He's a follower of, of Yahweh. But he's not, he's not a believer. And yet the wisdom that comes from, from, from his words, I think our modern day church needs to really embrace that God does not need us to defend him. He does not need us to fight his battles. He needs us and desires and commands and wants us to obey him. And so if, if we don't, if we don't follow him the way he wants, then we might be in opposition to him. Do you see, I, I, I mentioned this last week. I said it was easier to follow the, the rules and follow the Ten Commandments than it is to live by grace. Remember I said that? I know I said it because I actually watched the video again last night. So I know I said that. And it is. It's much easier to, to say, well, I shouldn't do this because... It's much harder to say, God, I'm going to let you be the one who worries about the results. And if what I'm doing is against what your, your Ten Commandments or what Scripture says, then God, I'm not going to do it simply because I love you and I want to honor you. But I'm not going to let the law control me. So that means three things. One means we need to know what the Word of God says. And more than just, for God so loved the world. Because we all probably know that verse. John 14, 10, right? John 3, 16, right? <laughs> so we have to know what Scripture says. We need to be praying about what Scripture says and asking God to help our lives line up with what Scripture says. So we need to know what Scripture says. We need to be praying about what Scripture says and how we line up with what Scripture says. And then we have to be people. We have to be people who live by the word for the glory and honor of God. And that's where the rub comes. Because if we're in the word and we know the word, then we know you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't kill, you shouldn't... We, we, we know all those. And so we've got to live in the freedom that says... This is who I am in Christ, and I'm going to tell you the good news, and I'm going to let God do his work in you. And let me tell you what he's done for me. And let me show you what he's done for me. And let my life be an example of what God has done for me. But it's much easier to say, well, don't do that anymore. Stop it. You know better. As, as a parent, did you ever tell your child, don't do that? You know better than to do that? And you did it anyway. And so it's, it's, it's literally living in a loving relationship with the God who made you. Instead of living by the rules, ignoring the love of God in your life. And not only the love of God in your life, but the love of God in other people's lives. You see, I don't line up to a lot of what you expect. Someone told me here about three months ago, you just, you don't look like a preacher, you don't act like a preacher, and thank you, Jim. <laughs> that was not their response. <laughs> their response was, you don't look like a preacher, you don't act like a preacher, and so you, I, I, you're not going to be my preacher. 
because I want someone that dresses like a preacher. I want someone that talks like a preacher. And I, I, want, I, want, I, I want, I want, I want. And I said, let the road rise to meet you. No, I didn't. I said, you know, I said, uh, you know, I, I was really nice. I said, I feel sorry for you because you're putting God in a box that says, if, if, if this person doesn't meet expectations that I have set for myself, then they cannot be a person of God. And I said, and I really do feel sorry for you. I said, because I don't know what you're looking for. And I know most of the evangelical churches here, and I don't know where you fit in. I said, because I know guys that dress like a preacher that, or your idea of a preacher that talk like a preacher that I would never in my wildest dreams ever ask someone to go and be a part of that fellowship. I said, if you want to go try it out, be my guest. But see, we're all individuals that God said, Charles Green, I've saved you with all that you are and all that you ever will be. I know your past. I know your present. And, and Lord knows I know your future, Charles. And I'm going to work in you and through you, and I'm going to allow you to become the person that I know you can be. But if you don't let me do that in you, then all you're going to have are the rules. All you're going to have is religion, and religion cannot save you and keep you. Christianity is a religion. But Christianity is also a way. It's a way of living that supersedes religion. I am proud to be a Christian. Because Christ is the head of our religion. But if we start worshiping Christianity and stop worshiping the head of Christianity, then we've got things out of whack. And that's kind of what this guy's saying to his, his followers, saying, you know, just think about it. Do you really want God mad at you? Do you really want God mad at you? Do you really want to be in opposition to God? <laughs> ah, you're toast. <laughs> Uh, you know, and just a couple chapters previous, Ananias and Sapphira, and they died because they opposed God and they lied to the Holy Spirit. So they had just seen the power of God in action for those who opposed God or who lied to God. And I don't know if these, these Pharisees saw this or not. Probably not. But the wisdom points this church. Remember, God can do what God wants to do. Because God's God. And so, let me finish this up. Verse 40. Oh, I've got to read verse 39 again. But if, God, but if, it, is, if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may even be found fighting against God. They took his advice. Probably the, the one smart thing they did in 20 years. They took his advice. And after calling the apostles in, they flogged them. Not really bright, but they had, to, they had to show they were in control. So they beat the apostles and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then released them. And so Peter punched the chief priest and he knocked out two of his front teeth. And James, no, that, that didn't happen, right? They, they, they did the kung fu fighting karate stuff. No. It's, here's what happened. Because they could have done that. They could have fought against them. But here's what happened. So they went their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been, been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day they went to the temple and house to house and kept, on, kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So they got beat up. They got whipped and they got a scolding. But they continued to do what they were commissioned to do, which was to take the good news of who Christ was. And they never stopped. But they never, they never allowed their circumstances to take them off course. Because again, we know Peter. Peter cut off the guy's ear. We talked about that. So we know Peter has the propensity for violence. And here, no, the uh, Holy Spirit's changed him. 
Christ has changed them. And they are so in tune with what their purpose is. And their purpose is, is to live a godly life and to tell others about the life. That's what we get to do. We get to tell others about Jesus. We get to tell others about our life in Christ. And the purpose that he's called us to. And so they just, they, they just kept on. They kept on being real, authentic. But it's, it was a they kept on. Peter didn't go, well, I'm going to go over here and do this. And you guys go do your thing. Well, you know, we, we're not friends anymore. They did life together. And that's how God expects us to do this. Is life together. With all of our unique personalities, with all of your faults, all of our flaws. And he says, I want you to know that you are my body. You are my church. And he says, simply live life for me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this text. Lord, I thank you for this um, example in scripture, Father, of, of wise words from somebody who was opposed to you. Somebody who thought they knew what the truth was and yet w were wise enough in their sense and in their education and in their understanding to know that you are God. And that ultimately at the end of this world, at the end of this age, when Christ returns, that every knee will bow. That's a forgiven truth. And so, God, I pray that we would, this very morning, Lord, ask you to give us a clear mind, a clear vision, a clear direction. Father, that you would, as we pray and as we sing, that you would speak truth into our lives about us. If there's anything in us that is hindering us from, from following you, from, from people seeing Christ in us, Lord, would you show that to us? May we confess that as sin. May we repent of that. And, and in, in, in glorious repentance, Father, um, worship and celebrate the work that you're doing in our hearts and in our lives. God, I thank you for loving us. I know, I know I'm not deserving. I know none of us are deserving. And yet in your great love, you chose to make a way for us to have a relationship that will go in and through eternity. And so God, help us, each and every one, to worship you and to faithfully respond and do as you lead us to do without jealousy, without fear, without reservation, that we humbly would say, Lord, here I am. And decide that we're actually going to follow Christ and live a life that is pleasing according to you as we study, as we read, as we pray, and as we seek your face every day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to ask if you'll stand. We're going to sing the same hymn we sang last week, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. The words will be on the screen. The, uh, the, on the back of your bulletin is the sheet music for it, so you can sing if you like to do that. Um, I think it's appropriate that we simply decide, make up our minds, make that decision, that today I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I'm not going to leave any stone unturned. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make any excuses, God. I'm just gonna be open to you and to what you're doing. And so God, do your work. As we sing, respond as God leads you, because you know what you need to do. So let's sing. <laughs>